Welcome to our sabbatical story, episode... Episode four. (laughs) Episode four. Uh, Welcome back. Hopefully you've listened to the first three episodes of this series and you've been following along our journey of our first ever sabbatical. My name is Rachel and I'm here with my husband, Luke. Hey, Rach. Hello. (laughs) And uh, earlier this year, we took a two-month sabbatical away from our work as pastors in our local church and we've had lots of friends and family ask us what the experience was like and so we're here talking about it yep and so if you haven't listened to the other three episodes uh we talked about the first what we did the first two weeks being on a family holiday and how god started to speak to us through those experiences then the last episode we talked about the wonder of our and the unexpected wonders and surprises i guess of our short trip to the barossa valley in week Mm. three and we're up to week four which is all about you luke yes well yeah do you want to just recap why we are doing this like the structure of the sabbatical was that i would have some time away in silence and solitude following the the advice, recommendation and principle of the um, spiritual discipline. I was getting into that, yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, you don't – you lead into that then. Well, the, so with these next two episodes, mm-hmm. this one and the next, uh, will focus on pretty, pretty um, strongly – uh, on each of us individually because we y- yes what you're telling everyone is that in the middle of the sabbatical we had structured time for each of us to practice those disciplines so um it's something that we read about mm-hmm. in preparing for our sabbatical however it's also something that you and i have done the past couple of years anyway mm. at a smaller scale and really loved and mm-hmm. so what we've done the past couple of years is we've taken turns to go away just for a couple of nights on our own nearby to home, but away from the regular day-to-day responsibilities of work and family um, to spend time with God and seek to hear from him about vision for our church and our lives for the following year. Yeah, We've done that in about the middle of the year, the past couple of years, and it's been a really richly rewarding experience and also difficult at times to spend time alone I'm looking at you because... Oh, you, it's difficult for me or it's difficult for you? I think it's been more difficult for you on occasion. You've reflected back to me, but I could be wrong about that. Yes, I think it has... Well, difficult in, in the sense that it's more unfamiliar territory. Yeah. Because I, nat- I naturally gravitate toward people and I do find that people naturally gravitate toward me, so I tend to be always with people uh, other than when I'm kind of doing focused work. So when I'm not doing focused work and I'm just being mm. um if i'm not with others it is a bit unusual so it does create space for me to think in ways that i wouldn't normally think and to be slow and um, considerate and allow my mind to and my you know spirit to uh, go places that it wouldn't normally go to because i would be you know talking with other people mm. So, yeah, it's not that it's hard, but it is a bit different. Well, and I think it would be different for different people too because I think, you know, because you're more um, energised by being around people, that's the part of it that you maybe have struggled with the most or find more more of an adjustment when you go into that space of solitude. Yeah. Whereas for me, I I don't necessarily mind that, although it's still always an, adjust, an adjustment for me too because – even though I'm an introvert, I live in a household of with five other people, and I'm around people all the time. So it still it still requires a bit of a settling down. Um, but I've had my own other challenges with uh, experiences like this in the past, which I might go into next week. Yeah. Um, so just the setup here is that when we planned the sabbatical. Um, we planned this moment of time and we were looking forward to the opportunity, each of us, to go for a little bit longer yep. than we've done in the past. We, out of our personal family budget, we already allocate money each year to leadership development. Mm-hmm. So we had some money there. We gave each other a budget and the freedom to choose however we we wanted to spend that money. So, oh, in Cool. I, I, could, I didn't realise that. <laughs> I could have just uh, gone to the movies 24 times. You did actually go to the movies, <laughs> I mean, once, yes. Um, so in 
real life terms, this week was the week our kids were back at school. So I was at home and you tell us about how you chose to be where you chose to be that week and like, why. Well, I kind of tried to have the best of both worlds because I am an extrovert and I am stimulated by other people uh, creatively and, and um, you know, cognitively. I do, I do just kind of find myself being able to think about the deeper things in life when I'm when I see other people. So being mm. completely isolated from others would have been mm. I don't think it would have been very stimulating. I think I might have just gone a little bit crazy. And I thought, well let's just try that. So I kind of Do you like people watching as much as me? Yeah. So I like people watching. I, I like people talking. So I'll go and say hello yeah, to strangers. Right. How are you going? You know, what's your name? What are you doing here? Or, you know, I know that we're, when we go out for meals and stuff, I'm the person that wants to talk to the staff and you're kind of like, oh, don't do that. They don't like being spoken with and all that sort of stuff. So we have a, so we're just very different. Uh, okay, so you've just said something about me that's not true. But anyway, I'll keep oh, going. No, yeah, I know. But sometimes I might overdo it a little bit and that might be why you get a little bit uh, you're just a cautionary. Anyway. So I, I, <laughs> I don't want to do a deep dive on this topic right now. <laughs> and so I found that um, – so the decision was, uh, my decision was to go to Sydney CBD where I knew there would be lots of people and people from diverse backgrounds and with different life experience and I knew I'd be able to people watch but also meet new people. Uh, really? Did you think you were going to meet new people? Not, well, when I say meet new people, I don't mean you know start a brand new friendship. I just mean say hello, you know, find out a bit about, you know, their story. I mean, I met, I talked to most of the people who I went and bought coffee from. Did you? Yeah. Hey, what did you find out about them? Um, well, um, really just how their day was. <laughs> uh, what they were doing that day. <laughs> I had a feeling you were talking up this idea of like finding out about people's <laughs> stories. <laughs> So what you did was you ordered a coffee and you said, how's your day been? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> things things like the, when I checked into the um, hotel, I was like, oh, because it was new. I was like, oh, hey, you know, this – I mean, it's also – people don't often want to get into much of a conversation True. with you. So you're like, oh. Especially hey. in a busy city. Well, this when I checked into the hotel, I was like, oh, this is a new – this is, looks new. Like, how long has this been here for? And the lady said, oh, you know, she just oh, said something years. like – No, she just said something like, oh, we've just opened. It's been open for three months. Okay, and then she started talking about what that means for my checking in and checking out. It was a self-check-in and self-check-out, actually. Hmm. She was only there because to iron out the bugs, but in theory, I should be able to... Not see a person. Not see a person, hmm. which was defeating the purpose of me being there. Anyway, um, so yeah, so the idea behind it was that I could be amongst a lot of people but still be somewhat anonymous and hmm. or, and still be have and have a sense of solitude whilst being stimulated by, you know, crowds and people and activity. Yeah. Okay, so you had three nights away, I think? Yes. And did you, before you left, did you have plans for what you were going to spend that time? Yeah, well, as you said before, we've done this a number of times where we plan to have a a few nights away on our own. Mm -hmm. And in subsequent years, I have, I had gone, I went into those weeks planning to read certain things, research certain topics, come away with, you know, one one time I went away, I wanted to come back with like a church planting uh, a program um, or strategy. Mm. One time I went away, I wanted to come away with, I wanted to do you some research. I wanted to do a study and research on, uh, on the history of Pentecostalism in Australia, uh, revivals actually, Pentecostal yeah. revivals in Australia. So this time I've just felt to go in with no preconceived ideas or plans. I mm-hmm. just kind of wanted to be led by wherever the circumstances took me and whatever the listening and reading that I was doing at the time, you know, took me to because I had plenty of time to, you know, to, to read through books and listen to books and listen to podcasts. And so I thought I'd, I'd try that and just follow the rabbit Warren down toward wherever it took me. So that was the plan, mm-hmm. to have no plan. And okay. also, I, you know, when I got there, I messaged my professional supervisor who's from Sydney and I just said, oh, hey, I'm in Sydney for a couple of days. Are you around? So that kind of thing. And yeah. then he was around and we met up and we ended up having like half a day together. 
Um, and another friend I called out of the blue and was able to have a long chat over the phone with them. So that kind of thing, just a bit more spontaneous as opposed to mapping out a full schedule for three days. Yeah. Now, how do you want to do this with kind of reflecting back to that? Do you want do you want to kind of tell us how your time ended up being structured or do you just want to kind of take us um, – through the through the time chronologically and and tell us what you know what happened and what God revealed to you all in the one. Yeah. Okay. So I journaled a little bit of it. So I'll I'll basically use that as the string springboard, and then we'll go from there. Mm. So it's, it's kind of chronological. Um, so as I said, I I went in. The first thing I did was I because I was there for a few days. I messaged. A couple of people and said, "Hey, you know, do you want to have a, a conversation or a catch up?" And so I did that, and that then meant that it was a couple of things I was blocked in, blocked in a phone call and a, a coffee. Yep. Uh, and to, and to be honest, the next kind of thing I did was I just walked a lot. That was kind of how I filled in the time when I didn't have anything planned. And while I was walking, I was listening to a book or listening to a podcast. Uh, and on the walking, I would just allow myself to be led to the next thing. So, you know, walk past a, a cinema. I think, oh, I might see if there's anything on at the movies that I might want to watch. And so I, you know, Google what was on at the movies and then plan to go to the movies. I think it might have been the, the following day. So um, so I did that. Um, I ate. I think, I, I think I ate out every night. I went to one restaurant one night and I really liked it. Actually, it was just a pub. I really liked it, so I went back there every night. <laughs> um, and I was able to, you know, continue to listen or read there. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, so to give you an example, I was listening to a podcast by Pete Scazzaro about decision-making. And that was obviously poignant because this was a season where you and I were talking about making some decisions about the next season of our life, the next seven-year season of productivity. Um, what should our new post-sabbatical normal look like? And so decision-making is a part of that. And so I was just trying to be informed about that. You know, what are some mm -hmm. good um, approaches to making decisions? And so that podcast led me to a book that he quoted called Letters to a Young Poet by uh, Raina Maria Rilke. Mm -hmm. And... I thought, oh, I should listen to that book then. So after I listened to those three or four podcast episodes, I started listening to that book. And that book was really uh, interesting. I would never normally pick it up off the bookshelf. Because it's quite old, isn't it? Yeah, it is old. Well, I can't tell exactly how old it is now. But well, it's... I think he's writing those letters around the turn of the 20th century. Mm, mm. Yep. Like in the, yeah, early 1900s. Early 1900s. Yeah. And so there's that particular that particular book is about a, a budding you know creative that's wanting to make it in the world of you know writing and he admires this particular uh, author Rainer Maria and so he writes to Rainer and then Rainer writes back and the the book is a collection of the return letters mm. and not mm. the letters from the young poet no just to just the, the return poet. letters so mm. it's kind of like the book of Corinthians it's like the mm. letters to the Church of Corinth. Yeah, I never thought about it like that before, mm. like the Pauline letters. Yeah, so you don't have the letters that Paul receives, but yeah. you have Paul's letters back to the yeah, church. That's interesting. Mm. So, that, so you kind of then you have to read into it the questions. Yeah. So you, or you're getting at the answers, but you don't really know anything at all about the person they're being written to, other than what you can read between the lines. That's a, that's kind of a subtext, but it, still, it's a it's a good idea. It's a good way to write. But anyway, so I was listening to that that book. And there was one really profound moment in in that book that um, that really spoke to me about decision making, and kind of it kind of sealed, I, I think, a God idea that I feel I felt as though God had been do, doing in me and, and stirring in me probably for the last two years. Uh, my my God word for the year for twenty twenty two was the word wait. And my word for this year was um, decrease, well, increase, but it's from that verse in John where it says, uh, where John the Baptist says, for Jesus to increase, I must decrease. So it's this kind of, you know, juxtaposition, uh, juxtaposition of I need to decrease. So it's a similar theme of waiting, taking a backwards back seat and not being up front. And so in decision making, 
I was thinking, you know, I'm kind of getting a little bit stuck on this thing. Like, you know, we've done 10 years together serving in our local church. I feel like there's a next season coming that should be something of significance. You know, we should be able to, you know, forge ahead, take new ground. But what what is what should it look like? And and I can't just keep waiting and keep taking a back seat. We've got to be making a decision about taking big steps forward. So in listening to this book, I came across this this paragraph, which I'll read. I think that's the best way to kind of um, bring you to it. Uh, it said, it says this, it says, allow your judgments their own quiet. So in other words, your decisions, allow your decision making, allow your judgments their own quiet, undisturbed development, which is certainly isn't my character trait. I like to rush, not rush mm. to a decision, but I want to get there. Allow them their own quiet, undisturbed development, which, as with all progress, must come from deep within and can no way be forced or hastened. Which again, you've got to, in the context of this I'm, I'm thinking, like I'm being led to this by having the, the time to let the Spirit of God lead me to a book or to a thought or to a podcast. So this is really, I really felt as though this was God speaking to me, mm. even though it's not the Bible, but I was led by the Holy Spirit to this particular moment, listening to this particular book as I'm walking through the hustle and bustle of the Sydney CBD, mm. thinking about what's next. I want to make a decision. I want to move forward beyond this sabbatical to the next big thing that God's got for our lives. Mm. So this is saying, in all decision-making, you can't force it or rush it. All things consist of carrying to term and then giving birth. Like all things consist of that. And I was like, wow, that's a powerful thought. To allow the completion of every impression every germ of a feeling deep within, in darkness, beyond words, in the realm of instinct, unattainable by by logic, to await humbly and patiently the hour of the descent of a new clarity, that alone is to live one's art, in the realm of understanding, in that of creativity. In other words, what he's saying is you've got to allow all of those things, the germination, like the depth of the, you know, the stirring, it's all got to do its work to be humble, to be patient. That's all part of the decision making before you even find, you know, any clarity. It goes on to say, in this, there is no measuring with time. So in other words, you can't measure the success of the decision based on how long it takes. And, that, and that's a challenge. It says, he says, a year doesn't matter, 10 years and nothing. Oh, ouch. And when I heard that 10 years is nothing, I was like, well, this is the 10 year break. Mm. This is, this is a, like, such clear confirmation that what I'm reading is from God. So 10 years is nothing. Well, what about how, sorry to interrupt you, but just before, like I literally dropped you at the train station for this part of the sabbatical Mm. after we had that um, prophetic word spoken over us at church that Sunday morning, which was we both took for ourselves, Mm. which was about a 10-year reset. Mm. And like being okay with the fact that God might take 10 years to mm. do something significant in you mm. and then start again. Yeah. And so I'm walking through the city. I've got the University of Technology on the left and I've got the train station on the right. And I'm literally in tears at this point, which is unusual again for me. I really felt like God was saying, you know, 10 years is nothing. I'm making a big deal about having a 10 year break and how it's such a significant milestone. But in the course of you know making decisions about what's next, sometimes ten years is nothing. In fact, the sentiment here is that it's it's not about time. Mm, um, wow, a year doesn't matter. Ten years are nothing. To be an artist means to means not to compute or count. It means to ripen as the tree, which does not force its sap, but stands unshaken in the storms of spring, with no fear that summer might not follow. And that's amazing. It stands firm in the storms of spring with no fear mm. that summer might not follow. So it's as though it just has this steadfastness, this knowing that this inevitability that life is coming, like new birth is coming. And again, I just felt like God was saying to me, like, what are you trying to force yourself? Why would you be worried? Like God set the stars and the moon in the sky. He set, you know, nature on its course. He, you know, tilts the earth on it at, at the right degrees of act so that it can, so seasons can come and go. And and I'm here considering, like, oh, I've got to come to a decision. I've got to work hard to find out what's next. So it's a, it a stark reminder. So to be an artist is it's not to compute, not to count. It means to ripen as the tree, which does not force its sap, but stands unshaken in the storms of spring, with no fear that summer might not follow. It will come regardless. 
but it comes only to those who live as though eternity stretches before them, carefree, silent, and endless. And he goes on to say, I learn it daily, learn it with many pains, for which I'm grateful. Patience is all, or patience is everything. And patience is not my <laughs> strong suit and is not in my nature. But I very much feel like that was just like a, a real gift from God in the in that kind of those, that first day and a half of the sabbatical, and very Mini sabbatical uh, in this in my break in yeah. that, in that break that few days few days. Um, yeah, and there was another quote from that book too, which I read later, mm. which was a great picture story. I think of what it's like to be in seasons of indecision. Uh, he he says to have patience with everything that remains unsolved in your heart. He says, try to love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books written in a foreign language. Do not now look for the answers. They cannot now be given to you because you could not live them. Mm. It is a question of experiencing everything, like experiencing even the question. Sometimes we just want to rush past the question, but experiencing everything. At present, you need to live the question. Well, it's just such a great turn of phrase, isn't it? I was going to. I was literally just going to say he's very good with words, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, no wonder he's a poet. He's a poet, but uh, and I, I guess I also in the sabbatical was a reminder once again, or, or I think the creativity, the part of me that is creative was stirred a little bit again because you know you get into the into the um, the routine of work and the administration of you know executing you know tasks and goals, and you, you kind of the creativity side of your nature tends to take a back seat. And so this helped to kind of stir that back up in me again. Uh, and then he goes on to say, um, you know, they can't be given to you. Um, at present, you need to live the question. Perhaps you will gradually, without even noticing it, find yourself experiencing the answer some distant day. It's like it's as though it just comes upon you without you even noticing it. It's a bit like the sap in the tree. It just, it just you know, it, 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 the tree flourishes without trying. Don't you reckon that is so true of what happens with God, like in the faith life, though? Mm. Often, mm. maybe not all the time, but mm. you, you, you know, you might be wrestling with these big questions, and then you go down the path a little bit, and you kind of realise that you've started to see the answer, and you didn't even realise it. Mm, mm. Definitely. Yeah. So there you go. That's the first couple of days. <laughs> um, so beyond that. Uh, I had a phone call with a friend and in that phone call I was asking them questions. I don't like, you know, being in the question and in the waiting. So I said to them, hey, you know, what do you think my post-sabbatical life would look like? <laughs> what do you think I should focus on? Mm. And yeah, that was really good because, you know, I think it is good to invite other people to speak into your decision-making and get some advice and wisdom because we went into the sabbatical with a very open mind to what might be next for us mm. and – you know, different kind of ministry, you know, um, not maybe even no ministry for a season, you know, maybe just a different vocational, um, you know, pursuit, business, whatever, um, or stay or remain in the same ministry in the same place, whatever. Like we're just so open. Yeah. And I brought those questions to this friend of mine and they, they said, you know, that they still – and after the conversation, what they believed about me, I really did believe about myself that I still, you know, really believed that the church – you know, when the church is healthy um, and active and, you know, present in its community, it really is the hope of the world. And I still just want to be able to bring – like I want to, I want my life to be a part of that solution that the world needs. And if, if it is the church, then I want to be a part of that in some way. Mm. Um, and then I uh, also met with my professional supervisor, which was only going to be a coffee, but we ended up uh, having lunch, uh, having dessert – Lunch dessert. Lunch dessert. Uh, having another coffee. So we had like half a day together. It was really good because I was kind of getting a bit lonely by then. I think it was on the second last day. So, or the moment. Yeah, it was. It was like the uh, so it was the third, second day. A uh, fourth day, third day because I was there for four. I was there three nights, four days. So I was there. I was on the third day, and I was <laughs> by then I was getting really. I was like, I need to talk to someone. Anyway, so I'm. <laughs> Because the coffee guy wasn't giving you to do that. his ear off for half a day. But that was really good. And it was nice just to have someone to ask questions to. And, you know, and he wasn't really there to 
you know, solve any of my problems either, but it was just nice to be able to have someone to bounce some ideas off and just to talk with about what I'd already, you know, been reading and listening to and processing. And, and as, as an aside as also, I'd say that I think another significant part of that breakaway was almost like a relief valve um, where I was able just to, you know, not have to be at anything, mm. in anything. Even with me. Yeah, at a certain time, or kids, like, mm. you know, not having to get the kids through the showers at night or get their breakfast in the morning. That's, that's yeah, I think that's something not to be overlooked. Yeah. That the that f- space just allows all that stuff just to kind of come off you for a while. And it's obviously not healthy to live that, like that, but I think it's healthy to have a break from a break, that. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really good, you know, and to eat whatever I want. Yeah. You know, wherever I want. Just yeah. for a, a few days, you get to make all your own decisions. And yeah, it's fun. So I think, and that way you can come back and you, you do. You miss the you miss the responsibility. Like you miss the weight of actually and the being, routine. Yeah, you miss it. Um, while you're in it, you don't feel like it's missable. You like mm. this. You, know, you feel like it is missable. It's like oh, I could get out of this forever. But mm. then when you are out of it, it doesn't take long to, for you to think. Oh, I want to get back to the routine. Like I want to get back to you know healthy eating and <laughs> exercise and. Um, yeah, so that's the relief valve thing I think is, is also really beneficial um, in that um, that break. Mm. I mean, from my perspective, that week was really interesting because I realised by the time we got to that week, week four of the sabbatical, mm. I hadn't actually spent more than like three nights at home for a long time because before the sabbatical even started, I was away on a mission trip then I was home for like two nights or three nights, I think, uh, before we led our Hunter Region event, which was an overnight thing mm-hmm. for us anyway. Uh, we were a couple of nights away. And then I was home for two more nights. Then we went on our first big break of the sabbatical. Mm-hmm. Then home for a couple of nights. Then we went to the Barossa. And then finally I got a chance to be at home for a few nights, mm. like for that whole week actually. Mm-hmm. And it was both good and bad. Like I loved it because it was just a ah, like in your own bed, get to the bottom of the washing pile. Mm. I was enjoying oh. doing all of the kids stuff without having to do work stuff. Like that was a treat for me because mm. um, I had an early morning drop off for a school camp and whatever. I enjoyed going to the gym later in the day and not getting up early, all of mm, that. Mm. But what was weird about it was being home in Cessnock where we live mm. And being around people that we know, like running into them, mm. but knowing that my life was just feeling and looking completely different to normal and theirs weren't, and but we're still in the same place mm. at the same time. Like mm. it was just – it was a really odd f- feeling. Mm. However, my journal from that week um, says that my favourite night in the week was Wednesday – Mm. When Luke returned home from his time away mm. because I had planned a special dinner and we opened a nice bottle of wine and we talked for a long time about what it was that God had been saying to you, mm. some of which you've just shared um, with us now. Um, I've... I've written here, Luke was visibly moved as he recounted one particular part of one of those letters from Letters in a Young Poet, Letters to a Young Poet, and read it to me. So you even had, like you just shared, that you had an emotional response as you read it for the first time, but then you had a, another rem- emotional response when you shared it with me. And, um, you know, that was pretty inspirational for me then to read it. I ended up reading that book the following week when I was away by myself. So it was just, I don't know, I just point to that to say it was just another one of those things where we could see God working in each of us separately and individually, but also in us as a, you know, as a unit, as a team, Mm. um, as we were both, you know, wholeheartedly seeking him about what what our post-sabbatical life would look like. Mm. Yeah. And I guess there's not much more to say. I mean, I could wrap it up, I guess, with a, like my time with a couple of other little thoughts. Um, one is to say that after I read that book, I then discovered that it, <clears throat> that, that book was the 
inspiration for another book that was of a similar title called Letters to a Young Pastor mm-hmm. by Eric Peterson, mm-hmm. Eugene Peterson's son, Eugene Peterson, the author of um, The Message Bible. Paraphrase, yeah. And so I thought, well, I'll read that as well. <clears throat> and so I started listening to that. I mean, you say it's by Eric, but it's really the letters from... From Eugene. So Eugene. it's the same concept where Eric writes Eugene uh, letters and Eugene, dad, responds back to his son mm. as a young pastor. And I was reading that also. And another thing that I was able to do while I was away was, again, kind of think about what it was that I that I love about, you know, life and ministry and work, what I don't love about it, what if I could just do whatever I want, what would it be? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and talk about those with those people I met with and, and have them feed back to me what they think, you know, I'm good at and where they think I would fit in a, you know, workplace or ministry life or, <clears throat> you know, what my focus or strengths would be. And, you know, and, and long story short, one of the things that, um, you know, I came away from that time thinking and, you know, I, I think the journaling is important too. Like if you're going to take that time away, you really should record it, you mm. know, whether you voice record it or both, or journal it, write it down, something so you, you don't lose it. You just simply forget otherwise. Yeah. You think you won't, but and you also, do. Yeah, and I also find that I can kind of I, – because I, I, I'm an external processor, if, I, if it's coming out of me, I've got to put it down somewhere – uh, and then I can look back at it and go, okay, well, let's let's kind of look at the themes and the ideas that are similar here, and 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 find, you know, where the common threads are. You know, what's what am I thinking? You know, or what's God saying? And so I was doing that about the next season of life and ministry and work. And after writing a lot of ideas down about, you know, what things could look like and what I love to do, and what I don't like to do, what brings me energy, what drains energy from me, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I really found that. Um, you know the answer to those questions. I mean, not not complete answers, but but the leading is that I am doing the th- kinds of things that I love to do. Like I do love uh, communicating and, and preaching, and I do love leading people, and I do love helping people find their purpose and their destiny, and encouraging them and inspiring them toward that for their own life. And that is what I do a lot of in my job. So it wasn't like I I, I needed to have a dramatic change in my life Mm. and when I was reading um, Letters to a Young Pastor by Eugene Peterson I came across this particular part of the book again I think it was a gift from God because he was leading me to this book based on the books and listenings that I'd, I'd been engaged in so because you know you and I were talking about well if every if everything's on the table if we go anywhere or do anything, you know, maybe we should consider, you know, changing churches or, mm-hmm. you know, handing our church on to somebody else. And, you know, we don't want to be stuck. We don't want to be kind of trapped. And so this is what I was reading. One of the, and this is what he says to Eric. Again, we don't know what Eric asked him, but mm-hmm. this is Eugene's response. He says, one of the standard solutions to stagnation fatigue and the accompanying banalities of mid-careerism of pastors, which is kind of how we felt, well, I felt I was in, is to change congregations. I'm glad that you're not considering that, although I'm sure that it has crossed your mind. Almost always, but not always, that is a cheap solution and prevents a deepening of your life in the spirit, both personally and vocationally. Do you know that the monks in contemplative orders, the Benedictine and Carmelite, have a word for this? So... The word translated is the destruction that wastes at noonday. Catchy. That's what they called it. I came across that when I was in the middle of it and it helped to know that this happens often enough to those of us who are in holy orders to have a name for it. Mm. It is not necessarily a sign that I'm doing something wrong, which would mean that there must be a solution to it. Mm. Well, that's right. It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong just because you feel a certain way about where you are, who you're with, what you're doing. And again, I thought I just thought that was just a gift, like a, a confirmation that mm. you know from all the thinking and dreaming and you know reading and listening and writing that I'd done over those few days um, to come back and then to read that, it kind of just you know really put a pin in it. So I said, hey, you know, you're in the right place at the right time. 
you're doing what you love to do. You've been able to, you know, experience something restorative in that in those few days that you've been away, and you've also been able to hear clearly, you know, from me, from God, and so, you know, th- there's enough here for you in that time away to kind of move into the next part of, you know, the sabbatical break, mm. which was being home for a few days while you went away. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? It's funny. I actually had written here that um, my other memory of asking you what your key takeaways from your alone time away was similar to what you've just reflected and that was actually a gift to me. And I, like as you were just saying that then, I'm, I was remembering how I felt quite anxious about what you would say when you came home or what you would share and you were even a little bit reluctant probably because it's so personal and you would have to be so vulnerable Um you know, to share what it was that you'd experienced. But when you were able to um, articulate that, you know, God had kind of very gently and kindly showed you that the things that you're good at, the things that you're good at and that you enjoy are the things that you're actually doing now. Um, And, you know, it was like a bit of a balm, I think, for some of the discouragement, which I think that you've experienced in the past or felt in the past couple of years, mm. um, that it was a re- like it just points to what a valuable <coughs> exercise it is mm. to take that time out by yourself, mm. like just be okay with being by yourself with God mm. for a period of time. And like it's just miraculous. Like he, mm. he heals your wounds. He encourages you he uplifts you he uses the people around you to um you know remind you of your purpose and calling and all even the anonymous coffee attendant yeah <laughs> um so we're going to wrap up this episode the, the last thing i've got in my journal from that week is that we went to church again on that Sunday after you got back from your time away and before I went away on mine. Mm-hmm. And at that stage, I think we were we were on a, on Sunday five of the sabbatical, of the, sabbatical yeah. the middle <coughs> Sunday of the sabbatical. Me. And we had a conversation on the way to church that day down the coast where we were visiting. Yep. And we were reflecting that it's hard to believe we'd been away from our own church and work for one month and still had a whole month to go. Oof. We reflected that it's probably, I'm reading from my journal, we reflected that it's probably only now that our own church team would have been without us for long enough to actually stop thinking so much about doing what we want and hopefully begin to flex their own leadership and decision-making muscles. I reflected to Luke that it's actually really important and a good experience for them as much as it is for us, even if they don't re- yet realise it. Mm. Yeah. It was kind of a, at that middle point of the sabbatical that I had the aha moment that, wow, this is actually really good for our church mm. to get the opportunity to start to lead and, um, you know, be church without us there. Mm over their shoulder all the time yeah for sure and that was at the end of that week well that was a pretty inspiring episode hopefully the next will be just as good be better (laughs) from strength to strength (laughs) so we'll see you then next episode of our sabbatical story